Hello. Um, if any of you missed my introduction this morning, um, I'm currently a high school biology teacher with High Tech High in San Diego. It's a project-based learning school. And I also got my master's here at the University of Guam. I graduated in 2015 and completed my research in 2014. And I graduated um, with an environmental science master's, but I did my research out of the marine lab. Um, and so a lot of what I'll be talking about today is influenced by my time in that program. So I'll be talking about assessing artificial reefs in the natural environment. Um, this is a photo on the left, or your right, of um, one of the vessels in Truck Lagoon. And so I've spent the last three weeks, as I supported the field school with UOG, thinking about some driving questions. Um, I've been thinking about how can the natural environment on and around artificial reefs be documented to understand their impact on the ecosystems they are in, and what monitoring methods are best for individuals without a background in biology and or taxonomy. Um, and that's because I'm really interested in how our natural environment is growing on and around these um, World War II sites. So I included a little bit of background, both on some of the sites and then some environmental background, since I know we have some varying levels um, of uh, background within the audience here today. So what is a reef? And a reef is material on or near the surface of a marine environment that may occur naturally or artificially. And the roles of the reef are very important. They're rich in diversity and productivity. They assist in water filtration, especially for water that's running off from our land sources. They're a nursery habitat for our pelagic species and also for um, other species on the reef. So all those nooks and crannies are super important and also for those smaller species that need to hide from predators um, or use that space as a place to seek prey. They prevent shoreline erosion, so that can be particularly helpful during storm activity um, and especially Guam and as we saw with that image of the wreck in Saipan, these areas are really vulnerable to that. And there's so many economic benefits, um, particularly with the tourism industry. Um, it's not everywhere has a gorgeous tropical reef filled with fish and beautiful coral. And people will travel from very far and spend a lot of money just to spend a little bit of time in that environment. So reef types, there's natural reefs, so fringing, barrier, atolls, and patch reefs. The one on the top is um, from Truck Lagoon. It's a little island there. And then on the bottom I have actually the, the same gun that John featured, I think, in his presentation, also from Truck Lagoon. And then there's artificial reefs. They can be intentional and unintentional. And so intentional um, sites, so submerged heritage sites, uh, potentially, are stripped and defouled, they're pre-selected, they're heavily monitored before and after, and it would be, the, the material that's sunk there would otherwise be surface waste. And they could include ships or subway cars, um, or believe it or not, Christmas trees. And they're varying in popularity around the world. Um, in Canada and British Columbia, they actually have currently stopped the ability um, of interested organizations in creating artificial reefs. The first wreck I ever dove was in British Columbia in the Courtney Sound. It was the HMS Columbia, and it was sunk by the um, British Columbia Artificial Reef Society. Uh, and then there's also other vessels in California, like the Ruby and the Yukon. Um, and then Australia has its own set of artificial intentional reefs. And studies are being done to see how effective they act as a reef habitat, both for benthic species such as coral, but also for fish communities. Um, and the Christmas trees is actually from lakes in the United States. They'll submerge Christmas trees and then they pack those lakes with fish and they use them for fishing. Unintentional reefs, um, artificial reefs, are sites that are not pre-selected. There's damage during submersion, particularly for these World War II sites. Um, there's fouling, there's listing, there's explosives, there's um, diesel leaking, um, and this can happen over a long period of time from the time of submersion even to, to present today. They're not stripped, so there's tons of wires and different materials and paints and other things that might be bad for the environment. And there's historical significance of many of them. Um, those World War II sites have come into protected status, and so even if they're causing environmental damage, it can be hard to uh, do things to them because they are protected. 
um, and many of them are war graves. So there's other, uh, in addition to just the heritage significance of that, there's the, um, the personal connection. So here's a map of World War II wrecks in the Pacific. There's about 4,000 wrecks that we currently know of. 99% of these are in exclusive economic zones. So these are areas that are close to the coast. These are places where people fish for their livelihood, where they recreate, um, where there's other commercial boat traffic. And unfortunately also, 80% of these sites are in areas of high diversity. So we're talking about coral reef areas, we're talking about mangroves, we're talking about seagrass beds. These are the lungs of the sea in this region and they're really important in helping the growth of species and sustaining um, species populations in, around, um, and in the open ocean beyond those sites. And these are just wrecks. They don't include dump sites. So CB Junkyard, for example, is a dump site. And that's just one of many. There's also a um, million dollar dump, which is around Vanuatu. There's tons around American Samoa, um, all over the Micronesian Islands. So it's pretty extensive. And, and that footprint isn't included here. It's estimated to be something around um, 3 million tons of vessels, um, and there's unknown amounts of petrochemicals and unexploded ordnance attached to these. So environmental monitoring. Um, this documents descriptors, including processes of biotic, so living elements, and abiotic, non-living elements of the environment. And some studies that have already been done identify three key areas of descriptors for coral reef areas. So looking at stony coral, and I, I increase this to non-mobile benthic species, um, reef fish families, so looking at mobile species, but then also the human use um, impacting that habitat. And that could be past, present, or potentially upcoming uses that might impact that habitat. And pictured here is the Jake Seaplane in Palau, which we did environmental monitoring on. Um, in 2013, and Sunny talked about that in her presentation. And so the application for monitoring, where would it go and how would it help us really is what people wanna know when they think about environmental monitoring. It can help detect major trends in habitat conditions and the connection between management. So maybe having a carrying capacity on how many divers are on a rec site can be um, derived and figured out from monitoring methods, or maybe thinking about what parts of the site you want to have off limits, if there shouldn't be penetration, or if they should stay away from certain sites. That's the type of thing that not just cultural resource monitoring, but environmental monitoring can assist with. Um, it also explores the connections between physical disturbances and the reduction in structure and size of reef complexity. So Vicky showed us those pictures of the um, Tonoas vessel and compared it with the Fujikawa Maru and the Suzuki. And you see that beautiful, huge nine foot something plus stony branching coral. And you just don't see that on the wrecks that are dove heavily. And so we really have an impact on how the reef structure builds up on our World War II sites as well as on the reef itself off of those sites. And monitoring can help us understand those impacts and gauge them and assign values to them. Um, and so, and along with that, we really can detect the degree of the disturbance, but then we can also detect the resilience of the reef community. Um, in a site like CB Junkyard, my research looked at how CB Junkyard serves as an artificial reef, and how different it was from control sites without World War II material near it. And CB Junkyard actually did a pretty decent job of supporting um, benthic coral growth and mobile fish species, so that was pretty exciting. Whereas um, a site like the Jake Seaplane in Palau had one wonderful tridacna, a giant clam, and then some growth of a cropper coral on one of the wings of the plane. Um, so maybe the plane itself wasn't great, but the footprint of that plane was so small it could easily fit in this room, whereas CB Junkyard was acres and acres and acres of material. Um, and so some of those dump sites have really different impacts just because of the footprint that they place on the benthic habitat. So there are some existing um, underwater cultural heritage tools, and they really are geared towards the heritage or um, higher level biological research. Um, so especially the Rust database resources and undersea threats, and it is undersea as one word in their, their paper, 
um, database, which they published on, but I can't find it online anywhere. So it's somewhere, but it's not publicly accessible or Google Scholar accessible over the last couple of years. Um, <laughs> there's a World War II wreck database through Australia where I got that fantastic map with those 4,000 World War II wrecks. There's the Wreck Oil Removal Program. It's a um, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration protocol published in 2005. Um, and utilized to some degree by different um, U.S. government groups. Um, and then there's the, they're recently doing, it's fascinating, um, surveys of the Atlantic wreck sites, and they're using remote sensing, but they haven't really explored like oil leakage and other things like that. They've just mapped like how the U-boats look on the surface. Um, new technology is the REMIS, it's a remote operating system that the Navy's going to be using to map sites we'll be able to compare some of our mapping with theirs. There's also Bill's work in Truck Lagoon looking at the environmental state of um, the Truck Lagoon sites. Um, but none of this has really been centralized and there's a lot of existing cultural resource work, but it hasn't really been married with or monitored with environmental work, even though there's so many of those sites in reef areas and in areas of high diversity and in areas that in fact impact the livelihood of the people that live near them. So um, I've come up with this awesome protocol using our field school. They were very enthusiastic participants and I learned a lot um, about how I can design a protocol that's successful for people that biology might not be what's keeping them up at night. Um, so uh, the first thing I did is I created a, a, a set of monitoring tools. So there's a presentation that um, interested parties can use. It talks about fish families and benthic habitats and um, things that they might want to be taking note of and it has protocols and supply lists. Then um, we went and we collected data during scheduled site work and this is the same type of thing that cultural resource managers could do while they already have site visits planned. So the idea is to design a protocol that's easily accessible and applicable to work that's already being done, because it's hard to get money for this type of research nowadays, so it's great just to marry the two, if possible. Um, and so they can look at the conservation, maybe they can look at corrosion and, and just document it through observation. They can use tools like photogrammetry, and then they can use environmental monitoring protocols. And then afterwards, they can process data and share it with local biologists if they need to, and environmental management organizations as needed. Um, for example, if you saw that there was no fish at a wreck site or there was no coral and there was coral before, you might want to bring that up to another organization that has a larger stake in that um, in a local region. And they can repeat these types of surveys during continued field work and just keep documenting and keep track of the changes. So for data collection, it's really important that we know what the conditions at the site are. We had some really beautiful days where you could just look down in the water and you could see the tractors and the dozers. And then the last day I was on this site, um, you could be free diving down 20 feet and couldn't see five feet ahead of you. So it really varies and that's the type of thing that's important to note because that could impact the data you're collecting or the species that are present. Um, and so it's good to be aware of that. And then we wanna know the site usage. We had some jet skiers, we had some submarine traffic, we had a container, a couple container ships. Um, we had some pretty heavy rain a couple nights before, and all of that could impact the site over time, not just the day that you're there. So it's really important to be aware of that. And then we collect um, data on the benthic species, so the coral, things that aren't moving, really, and then mobile species, in particular herbivorous fish. Those herbivorous reef fish eat the, the algae and they make space for the coral to settle um, and they kind of keep things in check in that area and so it's really important that they're present. So just to go back with some of the site conditions, here's a picture of one of the dozers and we really want to identify variables that might impact the findings of a survey. You might also want to consider tides if the depth is, if there's really extreme tides. We've had some big ones recently. Visibility, duration, weather events, Something I didn't put on here, but that's really stuck out to me. I've been away from the water here for two years, and it feels warmer. I don't know if anybody else that has been here is noticing that. I don't often get hot in the water, 
like actually hot, but I've been hot recently here. Um, and I have heard that the temperature has definitely increased. So that's really notable and that can have an impact on things like coral bleaching and coral stress and the fish that are present. So site usage, we've got commercial, recreational, military again. Um, there's a picture of a submarine. We saw that a couple days, actually. Um, and you really want to consider the spaces um, in the surveyed habitat and how they impact it, but also the duration. The military activity, for example, in the harbor around CB Junkyard and also the Tokaimaru and the Cormoran, that's constant and it's pretty heavy. So is that commercial activity. Um, and they're also in the harbor, there used to be uh, in the inner harbor, that was a mangrove habitat and a really great wetland filtration, that's gone. It's actually been dredged. So there's a lot of sedimentation in that area. Um, and so it's really important to consider that that's years of probably pretty much unchecked sedimentation that's impacting it. And then the habitat type. I'm not gonna monitor a mangrove the same way I would a seagrass bed. So I wanna make sure that that's the type of thing we're noting. So if we see that you know, in the mangrove, we're missing a bunch of parrotfish. We know that that's okay, because it's a mangrove. Whereas if I'm missing um, my parrotfish on the reef slopes and my butterfly fish, um, I'm gonna be more concerned. And that's a soft coral on the Shinkoko Maru in um, Truck Lagoon. And just to kind of attest to the, vari the differences on, on different sites, the Shinkoko is known for its soft coral, which really comes out at night and it's a great attraction. It makes an awesome night dive. Um, and so natural features such as that can be draws um, to a site, and we can actually benefit from them by promoting and protecting them. And by promoting and protecting them, we're also promoting and protecting the heritage that they're on. So for benthic um, surveying, I have them run a transect on and off the submerged material. So we want to control, so off the material and, and then on the material. And then they use photo documentation. I don't want to stress um, folks out and have them think that they have to record everything just right and be able to identify every type of coral. So they just take a picture periodically along a transect. Um, and then at the end, they'll measure the diameter of things under the transect if they can. And then at the end, they'll go around and anything that a transect wasn't on, if there's a couple large coral grows, they'll go take pictures and um, do a couple measurements just so we can document what's on a site. This is in Palau off of the Jake Seaplane. That gentleman is, is really hovering over it. It looks like he's sitting on that Acropora bed, but he is hovering. And there's just uh, tons of Acropora everywhere all around the seaplane. It was awesome. Um, and so that was a really easy survey to do, actually. And then for the fish survey, I'm still working on it. Um, I have a confession, I'm not the best taxonomist myself. I'm great at keeping things alive and identifying parameters for how they should stay alive and what, what makes it work. Um, and this is a work in progress. Like, I hastily grabbed the image for my angelfish, but it's a terrible one, for, so I'm gonna swap some of them out. But I took the major fish families. I worked with existing scientific protocols in Micronesia and existing um, data sheets that uh, NOAA uses and Gov the Gu Gov Guam Fisheries researcher uses for her own data. And I tried to make it more accessible for someone that doesn't have a background. So we included body shapes, we included a couple of the key species in the area, um, and all someone has to do is check off in the box if they see something, and then there's room for notes um, or additional descriptions or quantities if they're able to note them. And we tried to make it really flexible. What's important here is the fish families um, and then just understanding what's present and what's not. And so we had the chance to try it out at two sites. We did CB Junkyard and we did Am the Amtrak and Agate. And we're still processing the benthic survey, but all fish families were present at both sites as well as some megafauna, which is a good sign. Um, as far as the benthic survey goes, I will say from personal observation only, there is a ton of podina, it's a leafy algae, all over CV Junkyard, and I'm noticing more dead and bleached coral at that site. And so when we get the data, it'll be interesting to see how it also compares to my previous research at the site. Um, and that is a sponge in Palau on the right. 
And so for our next steps, um, we'd like to distribute it to local resource managers and community stakeholders for review and testing. So it'll be talking to groups um, in the Pacific that are already doing work that we have relationships with. And when I say we, um, Dr. Bill Jeffries has been really um, supportive and a huge proponent of this. Um, and so we have some ideas for how to take this further. And then we'll publish on what we find and continue to improve those protocols. It will also be really important to establish an electronic database and our website where the findings are centralized. There's a lot of like little collections of data on the environment of World War II wrecks and on the wrecks themselves and on the sites, but they're not very centralized and accessible. And so if at least all that could be put in one place, it'd be easier for people to manage it and look at trends on a broader scale. And that's my references. Are there any questions? I think I'm almost just at my time. When you're done with the, uh, analyzing your data, how do we get the information out? Oh yeah, you want, you want the goods? I'll follow, I'll follow up with you. <laughs> yeah, and then um, Bill and I, um, I made a website for interpreting CV Junkyard for my master's research, but um, there's a lot of protocols and things that have been started, uh, largely in Bill's work, and so we're looking at a place to centralize that and keep updates. Um, and have CB be one of the sites on that. CB makes a great training site, but um, the research and the examination really is ready to expand beyond just that one site. Yeah, and that's open to the public and has all my contact info, oh, all the necessary info on it. <laughs> yeah. Cool, I really enjoyed being back, so thank you. Okay.